Hey everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today I'm so excited we have Eben Alexander and Karen Newell here who are going to be talking about their most recent book, um, Living in a Mindful Universe. Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful if we were living in a mindful universe? All right, so um, Eben was an academic neurosurgeon for over 25 years and the author of the New York Times bestselling book, Proof of Heaven, the map of heaven and living in a mindful universe. And Karen is an innovator in the emerging field of brain wave entrainment, audio meditations. And um, they're gonna be uh, that work on, um, rests upon the foundation of heart-centered consciousness. So welcome guys. Hello CJ, it's great to be here. Thanks yeah. for having us on. Yes, thank yeah. you. So I wanted to talk about oneness. Well, first I wanna to talk to you, um, Evan, because it's been a while. I talked to you a long time ago. I don't remember, but um, it was when you had launched some of your books and it's almost been maybe a little bit less than a decade since I last talked to you. And when I, I remember at the tail end of that interview, you were talking about um, um, brain entrainment and music. And so I wanted to get a sense of what you've been up to, if you can, to kind of give me a summary of you had this incredible near-death experience in which as a neuroscience you started understanding the true nature of the universe and then um, tell me a little bit about um, what you've been up to and the research you've been up to in the last decade. Well absolutely um, since we last talked um, there was a, a medical group that actually wrote a case report on my medical records um, mm. and it was by Dr. Serbi Khanna and others um, and that came out September 2018 in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease. Mm -hmm. And that case report is actually very important because they went even further than I did in Proof of Heaven to document mm -hmm. the damage to my neocortex and paint the picture that that brain could not have come up with any kind of dream or hallucination uh, mm -hmm. because that brain, my neocortex, was too damaged. Mm -hmm. uh, just as I pointed out in Proof of Heaven. Uh, and in fact, the case report only got published because when challenged by the peer reviewers, how could this case even happen? Because it looked too deadly to result in a full recovery. Uh, the doctors who wrote it said that it was because of the NDE itself that I had such a miraculous recovery. And I think that goes a long way towards um, pointing out the, the deep truth of what all this is about. The 12 years since my coma has involved work with other scientists and experiences around the world. Um, and for me, uh, a huge part of that journey has been re-exploring my NDE, going back to it through meditation. Uh, and for that, I'm very grateful to my life partner and co-author of our third book, Living in a Mindful Universe, uh, Karen Newell, because uh, she is the co-founder of the company that that makes sacred acoustics. And, uh, just to kind of cut to the chase for your listening audience, binaural beats were first described in the mid-19th mid, uh, century. Uh, they were found in the late 20th century to engender uh, transcendental states of conscious awareness, for example, in people who are doing out-of-body experiences, uh, greatly enhanced by these kind of tones. Likewise, remote viewing, uh, one of the scientifically validated forms of non-local consciousness, uh, could greatly uh, be enhanced one's abilities through using binaural beat brainwave entrainment. And I believe the reason it all works is because these tones, slight differences in the two frequencies, end up affecting a circuit in the lower brainstem. So every sound you've ever heard that might have engendered a transcendental uh, experience, so chants, anthems, hymns, what have you, uh, they're all processed up in the neocortex uh, in, in the acoustic cortex of the temporal lobe that uh, is basically involving circuits evolved over the last um, uh, few mil million years. Very different from sacred acoustics and similar binaural beats that are affecting the lower brainstem. And I believe in a nutshell, that is why <clears throat> these tones can have such a profound power in liberating our conscious awareness. And I've used them in a very practical sense to return to my NDE. Uh, and not only to recover memories, but to develop very rich relationships with the various uh, uh, entities, uh, denizens with that uh, healing force, that infinitely healing uh, force of love, that God force, 
Uh, all of that is something that I have nurtured and cultivated through my uh, daily practice of meditation using very powerful tools like sacred acoustics. Mm, okay, so Karen, I want to find out a little bit about how you guys met. I, I, I mean, you can tell me how much your love story, like whatever, <laughs> but tell me <laughs> about how, how did you guys meet each other? I mean, where you're like, hey, by the way, here's some things for your near-death experience. Like, how did you guys connect? <laughs> Well, that's, that's a great question. Well, it was about three years after Eben's near-death experience, but before his book had come out. And so his, his experience mm -hmm. was, was known by local people, but not necessarily the entire nation and world. Mm -hmm. And so when we met, we were both attending a workshop where sound was used to engender these altered states of awareness. So I was already very much using sound for this purpose. And when we met, I knew that Eben had a near-death experience and I had met others who'd had near-death experiences. This wasn't new to me. And I also knew that people who had these experiences often came back with really profound spiritual lessons or, or knowledge, a, a very personal knowledge usually. And so I asked Eben, what was your big lesson on your near-death experience? And he says to me, the brain doesn't create consciousness. And I was confused because that wasn't very spiritual. And I, I actually said, well, why would anyone think that it does? I, I was so confused because <laughs> I was not of the same worldview that uh, all of consciousness arises from the brain or physical matter. And I knew that my consciousness was independent of the body just from my own personal experiences. So Eben had just learned this and he framed it in a scientific perspective. And uh, at the same time, he was talking about this incredible love that he felt over on the other side. And I said, well, what about that love? I, I think I've felt that love as well, but I've never had a near-death experience. And I've always been trying to bring that love back here. And he says, no, 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 that love is too powerful. In fact, that's what a lot of other NDEers have said as well. And I'm sure it's because when they feel it in that state, it probably is much more powerful. But I have been able to touch pretty powerful sensations of that love and oneness. Many others have too that I've spoken to just through practices of meditation. And so this is where we started to kind of exchange ideas on the role of the heart, what love really is, how you know sound can be used to engender these kinds of states. And that's where we kind of just began on our path. Mm, okay, so I'm sure you've explored this because you think about near-death experiences as, and reincarnation. Have you ever thought about what brought you together from a kind of a karmic spiritual level? Absolutely. <laughs> when we met, along with the intellectual conversations we were having, there was a very profound sort of uh, draw that we had. Um, I'll tell you, I'll just tell you, we were doing an exercise in this course and um, where we, we stood in a circle and held each other's hands and we were asked to feel the energy moving to the left and then feel it moving to the right. And then they asked us to get into pairs. And the exercise was to walk into each other's energy field while one stayed still and see if you could feel with your hands where you felt that energy maybe shift. And so as we were doing this, uh, Eben was standing still, I'm walking in and out of his field and I'm feeling this rather interesting uh, sensation. And I didn't wanna say it out loud. And I said to Eben, I, and we were supposed to tell each other what was happening. So I'm like, okay, you go first, what are you feeling? And he says, I feel the yin and the yang of our hearts joining as one. Oh and my thought, gosh. That's Whoa. best pickup line ever. <laughs> right? It was. What can I say? It's a very so, strong sense of mission, of, of, yeah, of togetherness, wow, of shared wow. purpose. And, uh, but, I, but it was really at that visceral level as well as sort of a, a, a knowledge level. Oh. And Evan immediately started talking like this about this mission we had. And I thought he was nuts. I thought, no, 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 I'm not going to be involved in some mission of yours, uh, but I really like you. So <laughs> that's kind of how it uh, 
Evan dragged me along when he ended up getting asked to speak at events and, and such, and he dragged me along in order to help people learn how to have these kinds of experiences on their own, because I had done this without a near-death experience, and he didn't necessarily know different techniques for doing this. And so that's when we joined together and uh, started to teach people, how can you experience this amazing love? How can you feel this connection mm. and uh, bring it into your daily life? So that's how we are. I today. love it. I love the yin yang of the heart um, yeah. and how wonderful. <laughs> Pretty obvious to me. Well, even just the whole story, because, you know, you kind of came at from a, uh, is it a right brain perspective? You know, it's like, it's about brain. And then you kind of came in it through music. So it's just like the uh, yin and a yang kind of perspective. And through the two of you, like yin and yang is that you create something, you know, you're, it's the creative impulse that when the two of you are brought together, that um, create something new, right? To well, create something oneness. divine. Isn't yeah, exactly. Right there. It is, yeah. it is. So um, I want to, um, because you had mentioned, um, Karen, that um, you that or Eben had said the love is too powerful, um, and you were saying, well, maybe that's because you haven't necessarily, you know, been been doing these meditations. So now that Eben, you've been doing these meditations, do you feel like the love? I, I don't know if you can even compare the two types of love that you felt in your near death experience and now through meditation. How does it feel similar or different? I'm sorry, what was that last part? How does the love that you feel when you're doing um, the meditations now feel different than the near-death experience love that you felt? Well, I think the love is something that um, in meditation, I occasionally encounter the same overwhelming kind of ocean of pure, unconditional oneness love, of connectedness, of, of kind of shared um everything with the universe i mean it's, mm. it's really extraordinary that, that feeling of oneness with the universe at large which of course includes all of our fellow sentient beings and of course this goes way beyond uh, just human beings uh, it involves all sentient uh, life forms throughout the cosmos and um i would say it's something that uh, to me has been very exciting uh to watch develop especially with the uh, the workshops that Karen and I do around the world, and of course, during COVID, they've been webinars, but the reality is a tremendous number of people that, um, that we've worked with, I, I think, are feeling and coming into that same sense of loving oneness through, uh, through the modality of, of sacred acoustics, which is mm -hmm. just a tool to help people get into deep states of conscious awareness. I think the most important thing is to remember this is not about thinking your way to the answer. You know, for my time in, uh, uh, in academics, uh, Duke Medical School, and then teaching at Harvard Medical School, all that, it was always using my logical, rational mind to think my way to the answer. And yet this was a whole new mode of knowing to kind of direct uh, openness to the universe at large to receive uh, information. And uh, that's the real gift. So it involves first and foremost in my meditation, turning off the little voice in my head. Uh, I love how Michael Singer in his book, The Untethered Soul, he calls that voice in our head. And of course, many people identify with that ego mind. Michael Singer calls that the annoying roommate. That is a beautiful way to put it. And that's how we should all look at that little voice in our head. That's not who we are. And it's certainly not the deep and profound mystery of consciousness. You know, Rene Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. And what I would clarify is what he was observing was that he could observe his thoughts as the awareness, as the conscious being. It's not the thoughts themselves that indicated his beingness. It was his ability to be aware of them. And that is something we all share. In fact, the universe has this mental layer of assimilation and integration of information in as sentient beings. We all have access to it. Mm. That's where I think uh, this concept of oneness and of the one mind that is certainly emerging from modern science of consciousness studies. One must remember, as Karen taught me three years after my coma, 
that one mind is nothing more than an infinitely healing, loving force, that God force at the core of all existence. Or you That's could just what we say, all share. Or you could just say one heart. Yeah, or heart consciousness. Yeah. However you want to do it. But, you know, I was up in my head, this Harvard neurosurgeon, and uh, the reality is Karen was absolutely right. It's a heart consciousness. It's a, a true sense of oneness with the universe at large. And that force that binds us together is one of kindness, love, compassion, mercy, uh, acceptance, forgiveness, gratitude. It's of helping others, of the mm. higher good. And I mm. think that was probably the greatest blessing of my journey and what is emerging from the work uh, that Karen and I do together uh, is really bringing this to light for, you know, tens of thousands of people around the world to help mm. them come into this sense of oneness, a, a perfect uh, kind of sense of purpose for their lives, sense of meaning that, that we matter. These are all crucial kind of ingredients that emerge naturally from this notion of the one mind and a practice of meditation. Mm, lovely. Okay. In the next segment, I want to talk to you more about the heart swirl in oneness. What is, I mean, I think you've described kind of the felt experience of oneness, but perhaps from a scientific perspective, what oneness actually is. Um, we've been talking to Eben Alexander and Karen Newell about their most recent book, Living in a Mindful Universe. And on March 6th, from one to five, they're going to be at East West Bookshop. So make sure to go to eastwestbookshop.com to um, sign up for the class. All right. Thank you so much.